The following is a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. March 2016 was the release of a new book titled Evolution and Human Sexual Behavior. Evolution and Human Sexual Behavior. It was written by Peter Gray of the University of Nevada and Justin Garcia of the Indiana University. The book essentially puts forth the evolutionary underlining of human sexuality, saying that human sexuality is malleable. It is essentially a product of thousands of years of change. It is simply a byproduct, if you will, of what is today many displays of evolutionary development. Dr. Elizabeth Lloyd of Indiana University calls it a, quote, marvelous contribution, end quote. Dr. Helen Fisher of Rutgers University says, quote, I'm convinced this book will become a classic, end quote. Much more endorsements to be noted, many other professionals to be offering commendation and praise for this work. And yet, this book and others like it are putting forward what is not new thought for us today to consider, not a new thesis overall. Essentially, the argument is that human sexuality is nothing more than a progression, an anthropological development of how man has lived in society that has progressed. And as much as we need to understand that, both today and yesterday, we need to be flexible with what that's going to look like for tomorrow and the years ahead. And correspondingly, our laws need to keep recalibrating to accommodate the public's opinion on this topic. All of this might have Christians like you and like me wondering today, are we just being old-fashioned in our view of sexuality? Are we just being a bit outdated, a bit antiquated with our thoughts? Are we more like our grandparents with their fashion choices and our beliefs about sexuality? Are we just advocating for the propagation of antiquated beliefs that are time-stamped from centuries, if not millennia or two ago? Well, the Bible tells us this is not the case. The Bible tells us that human sexuality is actually a gift from God himself to man. And it displays God's wisdom. And he has particular purposes for its use in society, as well as provides safeguards for its abuse within society. And we're going to learn that this morning in the book of Deuteronomy. If you've not done so, let me ask you to open your book, open your Bibles rather, to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Chapter 22. If you're joining us this morning, let me just welcome you again as you've already been greeted, I trust, both personally and pastorally. It is a desire of ours to have you with us as we're studying the Word of God. We're working our way through the book of Deuteronomy. We had a little side uh, curses, a side uh, uh, message last week for our time to kind of give us a bit of an orientation map of how to navigate through the Scriptures, particularly Deuteronomy, but now we return back to it. You're welcome to listen in on this, and even if you don't have a copy of the Scriptures, have one for yourself for free at the back lobby at the Welcome Center. They're just there for you. You can feel free to ask somebody, hey, where are those Bibles at? Love to get a copy for the future. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 13 through chapter 23, verse 14. As you can see on the screen, human sexuality, personal autonomy, or divine authority. For our purposes this morning, what I want to do is read the text in its entirety, and then we'll begin to break it down in bite-sized fashion. Picking up where Moses leaves off, verse 13, if any man takes a wife and goes into her and then hates her and accuses her of misconduct and brings a bad name upon her, saying, I took this woman, and when I came near her, I did not find in her evidence of virginity. Then the father of the young woman and her mother shall take and bring out the evidence of her virginity to the elders of the city in the gate. And the father of the young woman shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man to marry, and he hates her. And behold, he has accused her of misconduct, saying, I did not find in your daughter evidence of virginity. 
And yet this is the evidence of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloak before the elders of the city. Then the elders of that city shall take the man and whip him. And they shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the father of the young woman because he has brought a bad name upon a virgin of Israel. And she, she shall be his wife and he may not divorce her all his days. But if the thing is true, that evidence of virginity was not found in the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones, because she has done an outrageous thing in Israel by whoring in her father's house. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall purge the evil from Israel. If there is a betrothed virgin, and a man meets her in the city and lies with her, and then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry for help, though she was in the city, and the man, because he violated his neighbor's wife. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. But... If in the open country a man meets a woman who is betrothed and the man seizes her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. She has committed no offense punishable by death, for this is the case, for this case is like that of a man attacking and murdering his neighbor, because he met her in the open country, and though the betrothed young woman cried for help, there was no one to rescue her. If a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her and they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all his days. A man shall not take his father's wife so that he does not uncover his father's nakedness. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. No one of a forbidden union may enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came out of Egypt. Because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. But the Lord your God did not listen to Balaam. Instead, the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loved you. You shall not seek their peace or their prosperity all your days forever. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian because you are a sojourner in his land. Children born to them in the third generation may enter the assembly of the Lord. When you are encamped against your enemies, then you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. If any man among you becomes unclean because of a nocturnal emission, then he shall go outside the camp. He shall not come inside the camp. When the evening comes, he shall bathe himself in water, and the sun sets. He, he may camp inside the camp. He, excuse me, he may come inside the camp. Verse 12 of chapter 23. You shall have a place outside the camp, and you shall not go out to it. And you shall have a trowel with your tools, and when you sit down outside, you shall dig a hole with it and turn back and cover up your excrement, because the Lord your God walks in your midst of your camp to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore, your camp must be holy so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. We stop there. Now, right now, every parent in the room is sending their kids out to get something to drink and say, meet me back here at noon. It's in the scriptures. And every preacher is like, wow, do I really want to be an expositor <laughs> preaching all of the word of God? Yes, I do. And yes, we do want to understand this. Now, if you missed our lesson last week, let me just give you a brief orientation by way of review for others of you who were here, of where we are in the text and why this still matters today. We talked about the law of Moses. To be different from the overall law of God, the law of Moses, as given specifically to the people of Israel here in the 14th century B.C. of how they're to live. And how we've looked back on that law and sort of organized in these three categories. 
civil, how they conduct themselves in society as a governing people, ceremonial, how they conduct themselves in religious worship specific to how God instructed them at that time in relationship to Him in worship, and moral, how they shall understand themselves to interact morally regardless of the civil and ceremonial and how that contradicts them off in the world around them. And what we saw is while the civil and ceremonial is different then than it is today, the moral is not. That there is a transcendent reality that oversees all of Scripture as a representation of not a particular geographic place or a particular cultural limitation, but transcendent truth because that moral truth is related to God Himself in His character. And so in the middle of this text, we're reading things that are certainly civil, this governance of how they're to deal with immorality, the stoning of people, and it speaks here in verse 21, and again in verse 22, and again in verse 24 about purging the evil from your midst or from, Iv- from Israel. There is certainly an intentionality here to how they're to live. What I want to do, though, for our purposes this morning is I want to use the questions I gave you last Sunday at the end of the message where I said, you could take any text you read, any sermon you hear, and have these questions be questions that you think about in light of that text so that you might repeatedly and encouragingly see how relevant God's Word is still for you and for me today. So we're going to use those questions to kind of be, if you will, an outline upon this text here in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 13 through chapter 23, verse 14. And those questions, first of all, start with, what lesson about the character of God have I learned? What lesson about the character of God have I learned? Well, now let's go back to the text that we just read. We're going to, now having read the entire text, look at it in sort of snapshot fashion to kind of understand what's happening here. Well, first of all, let's understand the context. And in the text here, you have verses 13 all the way down through verse 22 as being the context of a married woman, how she is to be dealt with. And then in verses 23 through the rest of the chapter, through verse 29 specifically, is an unmarried woman, how she is to be addressed, how she is to be dealt with in light of this, this sexual immorality that's being addressed. Now, just to briefly explain it to you so you can get more context, what's happening in verses 13 through verse 21 is a man who was married, but decides after he got married, soon thereafter, he wishes he had, did not get married. Now, you need to understand something. In that time, in that culture, they did not have the dating context that we have today. They even have the language here, you'll, you'll, you'll see in the text, betrothed. There was betrothal. Now, for those of you who are young here, who are single, who still aspire to be married, like, oh, I'm so thankful we do not have betrothal still today. First of all, a lot of marriages happening in the rest of the world today are still organized based on betrothal. Parents deciding with other parents whose kids are going to marry who. And you're thinking, that is just, that would be horrible. That would be a relationship killer. Well, just so you know, statistically speaking, marriages that have been betrothed statistically have a better chance of lasting than those that were not. Now, parents won't get too excited. That does not mean you can now proof text that, that sort of relational fact to somehow justify this pursuit for you for your own children. But nevertheless, what's happened here is you have a man who has been betrothed to a woman and he does not like her. So the way he gets out of this, so he thinks, is to claim she's not a virgin. And he knows that that would be a capital punishment, and it would kind of remove him from it. It's, it's sort of an old school way of annulling the marriage. But the problem is, this has to be proven. But the proof is now on the father for whom that daughter belonged to. And I won't go into the details, just due to try to exercise some discretion in light of the uh, age group here that's present. But let me just tell you this. There was a way by which, by tradition and ritual, they would present to the father after the wedding night the proof that she was a virgin with where they were together. And he would keep that as future evidence, if ever needed, as proof that she was a virgin and the proof that that provided. In addition to how it was agreed upon prior to them even coming together in a relationship. So what's happening here is the man is basically saying, hey, she's not a virgin. Dad's saying, he, she was a virgin. The elders have to weigh in on it, and it's decided accordingly with the consequence. 
Again, verse 22, another similar situation, except in this context, you have a man who is laying with the wife of another man. This is a situation of now adultery. And now you have a situation then, in verse 23, dealing with another issue about somebody who basically seduces a woman who is betrothed. In that context, it would be like being married, though she doesn't live with him. He, she is seduced, and she voluntarily participates. To be contrasted from verse 25, where they're out in the wilderness, and he seizes her. It's essentially in the description of rape. This woman is raped in verse 25. What happens to the rapist, how he is treated, and what happens to them, and specifically how he is killed. And then you have in the chapter 23 these other areas. What I want you to see here is what continually goes through this text, though it seems culturally distant, is this repeating theme of dealing with the sin, dealing with the acts of others, holding people responsible, even the chapter 23, and it leads us into this sort of key text in verse 14. Because the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp, to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you, therefore your camp must be holy. Now, the immediate context of verse 14 is this basically outhouse commendation here in verse 12 and 13 of chapter 23. But the larger context of what's happening here in chapter 22 and chapter 23 is people of God live differently than the rest of the people around them because of who by association they represent. So we go back to the original question. What lesson about the character of God have I learned? I am learning here in the text how serious God takes his holiness and how much his people are expected to live their lives and to conduct themselves in relationship to each other accordingly. Because how we live is a reflection of of God, and I'm going to take you back to verse 14 of chapter 23. The Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you, to give up your enemies before you. Therefore, your camp must be holy. The significance here is even in seeing the New Testament today, where the temple goes from being a specific geographical place with a particular geotag marker, you could say, of where it is to be found. At first it was a tabernacle moving through the wilderness. It eventually became a particular temple with one specific location. To then, in the New Testament, when Jesus comes, introducing the new covenant, it later on says in Corinthians, the very letter we read this morning, that the people of God are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that each member of the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and that we ourselves are to conduct ourselves with an honorable representation. So that even today we realize God is not any less committed to his holiness than he was back then because of how they lived and how it represented him to the people. The second question we want this passage to answer for us is what truth or truths did I learn that has corrected an error that I previously believed? What truth or truths did I learn that has corrected an error that I previously believed? Well, one is what I've already touched on already, and that is that God has an intended design for human sexuality that is not upon and built upon the preferences of society or the individual in society. You see, today in our Western society, sexuality and its expression is seen understandably as such a private representation that it's largely believed it should be a private determination in such a way that however you determine, with whomever you determine, in whatever way you want to determine that you want to express your sexuality, that's your prerogative, and no one, including the government, or God himself has the right to tell you otherwise, because if you desire it, that's a part of who you are. That's the argument used today, that desire determines the direction of your, the, the direction of your life. And to deny desire is to deny personhood. Friends, what we see here in the text are a lot of people who have sexual desires that are corrupted, that are corrupted, that just because they desire it, does not entitle them to secure it. Now, some seem quite obvious. Some may be 
kind of confusing. The man who desires no longer to be married to his wife, for whatever reason, in verses 13 through verse 21, he decides he wants to change his decision and be set free from it. So he sort of sets up a conspiracy about her virginity and what's going to happen to him, what the consequence of that is. As it says there in verse 18, the elders of that city shall take the man and whip him, and they shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the father of the young woman because he has brought a bad name upon the virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife, and he may not divorce her all his days. He is doubled down in his commitment. Verse 22, if a man is lying with the wife of another man, Again, verse 23, if a betrothed virgin and a man meets her in the city, lies with her. Verse 25, if the open country, a man meets a young woman who is betrothed and the man seizes her and lies with her. Verse 28, if a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her. Each of these actions are premeditated based upon the desire of one, if not two, parties. And God repeatedly says, this is not how I intend you to use this gift of sexuality. It is given as a gift, as expressed between a man and woman in the context of marriage. That's not something unique to Deuteronomy. To prove that, turn to the left of your Bible to Genesis. Genesis, before the fall of man, how they shall be fought together in interacting with each other in marriage. Chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Then out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heaven, brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there is not a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up in its place with flesh. And that rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Significance here is not only that nudity in the context pre-fall was not associated with shame, but also the significance of how they understood the relationship to each other as being distinct and unique than any other thing God had made, than any other woman or any other man that God had made. And you'll notice, if you will, in Genesis, when he gives this command, he gives this command, and there aren't even mothers or fathers. There is no other relationship. There are no other options. But this is God's intended design from the very beginning of how a man and a woman would orient themselves towards each other in marriage with that exclusive, private, enjoyable relationship that only the two of them are intended to enjoy. Yet unfortunately today, that is the last thing that you will often hear represented. Instead, you'll hear things, as I referenced already, that society will just simply as changing cultural norms. Society has functioning democratic processes. Society is allowed to determine based upon the masses what they would enjoy. And whether it's Deuteronomy 22, Genesis 2, or later on in Matthew 5 or 1 Thessalonians 4, that is not God's expectation of human sexuality. As I said last week, it has nothing to do with preserving traditional Americana. It has everything to do with being accountable before God. So, we ask the question, what truths did I learn as correct and error? That first of all, what lessons about the character? The second one, what truths? Let me give you some of these, these truths here to consider. Becoming a follower of God does not mean I can live any way I want. Does not mean I can live any way I want. Desire alone is not enough. 
Secondly, God cares about my human sexuality and how I use it to honor him and others. That still is true today as it was then, though the consequences and the culture may be different. Third, sexual activity affects more than the immediate people involved in the act. This is the great lie that's often told today. It's your body, it's your time, it's your way. No one else has to know and no one else has to be affected. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is a community conversation. You'll notice that in chapter 22 and 23. And then fourth, God cares about how I come to him to worship. Notice repeatedly what's happening here in the text, including even in 23, those who are being rejected and those who are being accepted. How we're to come and prepare. Now, just to give some cultural background on chapter 23 in verses uh, 1 and 2, this is not accidental castration. These are people who have participated in religious practices of other false religions and have doing so, have as mind-blowing as it is to consider, have actually taken physical harm upon themselves in a way as an act of religious worship. God is saying those who have done that are not withheld from relationship with him, they're withheld from that assembly as a point of differentiating between their beliefs that they formerly had to the beliefs of the followers of Yahweh, of God himself. Then he goes on to speak about the Ammonites and the Moabites who rejected showing hospitality to Israelites, and yet Edomites, who are the children of Esau and the Egyptians, not the time they're in slavery, but the time in which they're being blessed and provided for, in the time of Joseph and following, that they should be remembered accordingly. In all of this, there is this repeated phrase, keeping evil from the midst. Remember that in verse 22? Excuse me, verse 21 of chapter 22? Again in verse 22? Again in verse 24, chapter 23, it comes up again. Verse 9, keep yourself from every evil thing. This repeatedly comes up over and over again. God takes the worship of him seriously. Now, we don't have bathing pools outside. There's not animals being offered on an altar so that you can walk into this room. But the words of Solomon in Ecclesiastes 5 still ring true today. Be careful as you draw near to the house of God that you do not offer the sacrifice of fools. What would that look like? What would that look like today based upon the teachings of Scripture? Well, not superstitiously, but how mindfully are you about coming before the Lord in prayer, in singing, in the teaching of and intentionality of this word and desiring to live openly before God, confessing any sin. Was what even just we read on the screen earlier this morning, was that sort of like a, just a sort of an organized act that we all participate in, but not something that's truly an expression of what you believe? See, friends, there's a reason why every single Sunday when we gather together, we have a time of praise, we have a time of confession, and we have a time of confidence and assurance of our confession being acceptance because of Christ the assurance of pardon. And then we have a time of teaching that we might continue to obey God. And then we have a, a time of benediction that we might be commissioned to live for Him still more. But do you understand that idea of confession? It's a repeated reminder that without Christ we have no hope, but with Christ we have all the hope we need. So there might not be raping in the fields. There might not be lying with strange people. There might not be these attempts to annul the marriage. But yet, there are still these matters of the heart that have to be addressed. Which takes us to the third question we can ask about the text. The first was, what lesson about the character of God have I learned? The second was, what truth did I learn that has corrected an error that I had previously believed? The third is, what area of my life should I address? I mean, honestly, if you're like me, you're probably like, um, yeah, good to know. If I ever go back in the past... Don't do those things. Maybe this feels like it doesn't really apply to you. But let's ask the question by consideration, personal reflection, how have I abused sexuality? Is it in my sexual promiscuity? I mean, notice, if you will, in verse 23 of chapter 22, that there's a mutuality to this act. This one woman is already committed in marriage to another man, though not yet living with him, having had the wedding ceremony, 
and yet she voluntarily is seduced by another man to be with her, to be with him. Sexual promiscuity becomes a point of consideration. What about premarital sex? It doesn't just have to be in the context of an existing marriage relationship. Those who are simply saying, I desire this even if I don't have this. This is what's happening in verse 25 through 27. What about pornography? What about pornography where I'm looking at a woman with lust in my heart? What about adultery? 21% of married men, 15% of married women have been unfaithful to their spouse. So one in five men, a little less than one in five women, have been unfaithful to their spouse. More disturbing and concerning than that is that when tested, as the results came back, 74% of men and 68% of women said they would cheat on their spouse if they knew they'd be able to get away with it. Three out of every four men and almost three out of every four women, if they could get away with it, want to cheat on their spouse. Now, I'm praying, hoping, believing the best that that would not be true of those statistics in this room, since those in this room, by and large, most of you self-identify as Christians and correspondingly desire to live differently than the rest of the world. But then there's the point of comparison as we're looking culturally how the rest of the world lived back then and by way of contrast how the Israelites are to live, how the rest of the world lives today and how we by contrast are not to be living. This becomes a point of consideration that should be soberly considered. I was just recently appointed to a work by Christopher Ashe, a book he wrote titled Married for God, Making Your Marriage the Best It Can Be. And in it, he gives six reasons why adultery is so serious. Number one, adultery is turning away from a promise. Basically saying that what God has promised and what is true in that marriage is actually not true, turning away from that to something else. Number two, adultery leads the adulterer from security to chaos. Some of you know this. You have sadly and tragically have had a history of an act. We pray it's only been one and not more than one, but not even that one of adulterous commitment. And you've known how that has promised something better only to deliver something worse. Third, adultery is secretive and dishonest. It proves itself by its very action how it is wrong. Fourth, adultery destroys the adulterer. It does not provide life. It takes life. It provides death. Fifth, adultery damages society. It is costly. It brings judgment upon society. It ends up affecting relationships. It even affects the family structures. And six, adultery hurts children. But see, friends, here's the conversation. The Israelites were having to be taught things about the world that they knew and how they should live in contrast to that. It's no different than for us still today as followers of God, believers in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We're being taught the things of the world and how we're to live different than that. Now, this is not just a, you know, quit it speech. This is a reality that needs to be honestly addressed. Some of you are flirting with former relationships, high school romances, co-workers that you're sort of enjoying the conversation through working trips or through social media extensions and you're, you're kind of dabbling in a fantasy world and you're wondering how close you can get to that and yet, yet it not affect you. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 32 says, he who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. The point that Scripture is saying is not, hey, this is adultery, and as long as you don't touch it, and you're only close to it, you're okay. That's not what Scripture is saying. Scripture is saying, if this is adultery, you flee from it. You get as far away from it as possible. And do not think, do not be too proud, man or woman, that this is not something that you have to be mindful of. 
singles, given into sexual temptation, thinking that perhaps if you get married, all this goes away. We could pass the mic here, and testimony after testimony could be given of married people who are saying, listen, marriage itself does not guarantee that this temptation fades. Because in the heart of man is this ongoing fight against temptations of the flesh that it easily and repeatedly and seductively come at us. So this is not unique to being married nor being single. This is common to man. What area in your life should you address? Do I need to address a casual attitude about it in my life even before I think about this with others and talk about this with others? Do I need to pursue others in conversation for the sake of accountability? Here's the good news. You will tell them what they already know about you. You are so sinful. It took the Son of God to pay for your sins as it did theirs. But that there's hope in Christ, which takes us to our fourth and final question. How does this passage make me appreciate the good news of Jesus Christ even more? How does this passage make me appreciate the good news of Jesus Christ even more? Well, first of all, whenever I'm in the text of Scripture, specifically the Old Testament, I am mindful that I want to look at how Jesus weighs in on this conversation or his followers, i.e. his disciples, other writers of the New Testament. And so immediately my mind goes to Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, where he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Oh, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Verse 31, he continues. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So Jesus who we like to think is like, hey, I apologize for the Old Testament. My father got kind of serious back then, but I'm here to lighten things up, which is sacrilegious and irreverent to think, but very common for people to think. He actually comes and he says, no, let me just be clear of the intent of all that. The intent of that was not just the supposed physical reality demonstrated in society. It was actually even your own heart because your actions were also indicators of your heart. And so even if you're looking with lust, you're committing the sin. At this point, we're realizing not people in the 14th century B.C., everybody on the planet, if nothing else, just in this area, needs a Savior. This is back with the adulterous woman that they bring to Jesus. And Jesus says, he who has not committed sin can cast the first stone. Who here today will pick up the rock and condemn another? Who here today will say, oh, me, not me. I've never been tempted. I've never had that passing thought. I've never wondered those things. I've never considered. Friends, it's not just society. It's every member in society, every person in our community, every person here in our assembly needs a Savior. And just to double down on this, Jesus says in verse 48 of Matthew 5, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's impossible. It is impossible. <laughs> Unless you're the Son of God who is perfect. Therefore, he says himself earlier in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, I did not come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. What does this passage, how does this passage make me appreciate the good news of Jesus Christ? That in my failed sexuality, in my failed 
appreciation for the gift of marriage, in my failed appreciation for the gift of how to think and treat others honorably, and my failure in society as I see it individually and collectively, that I realize there is one, his name is Jesus Christ, by which I can recognize he is my only hope. How does this passage make me appreciate him? It makes me realize I have hope and forgiveness through faith, not in my purity, but in his. And so I'm reminded again, even as I see this culturally distant time of the Israelites, of how I, even today, am finding my hope and identity in Christ, not in my own works of self-righteousness, which in the end are not righteousness at all. The last part to consider, did you have the reaction that I had reading Deuteronomy 22 and 23? Because of being culturally distant from it, did you kind of feel like at times a few of those incidents, that, that seems unfair? Why, why are people being held responsible for other people's actions? Why is this stuff happening to her? Why is this stuff happening to the dad? What? What about the, the, the generational distance? Does that, does that seem unfair? I was convicted when I had that thought. Why do I not feel the same way when I read about the crucifixion? That I am more concerned about a sinner in the field than I am the Son of God on the cross. That I'm more supposedly caught up in the injustice of an incident than I am the perfect Son of God who did not commit any sin making payment for sin that's not his, but ours on the cross. And then I'm reminded of substitutionary righteousness. That he takes upon himself my sin, making payment for it, while I, in exchange for having faith in him alone, receive upon myself his righteousness. So he gets treated like the sinner in the field. And I get treated like the sinless one who gets to go free. That's not fair, but it's how God designed it through His Son. And to that, all of us can in humility and with great thankfulness praise Him. Let's pray. This has been a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church or our senior pastor, Eric Bancroft, please click on the link below or visit castleview.org.